Good evening, everybody. My name is Will Knoll. I'm the director of the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you here tonight for this collaborative program organized and sponsored by the Jewish Studies Program at Penn, the Herbert D. Katz Center, and the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. Just a very few words about the Schoenberg Institute, um, founded by Larry Schoenberg and Barbara Brisdall, who gave the single largest gift to Penn Libraries that they've ever received in 2011. Um, guided by the vision of its founder, the Schoenberg Institute brings manuscripts, people, and technology together for the advancement of learning um, at Penn and around the world. Um, we uh, conduct a lot of different things. We have a journal, uh, the Journal of Manuscript Studies. Uh, we have um, grants totaling a million dollars to digitize all the medieval manuscripts in Philadelphia and beyond um, uh, from the Muslim world and from the uh, Western world as well. Um, and uh, we have a fellowship program uh, for graduate students, for postdocs, and for senior researchers. And it's wonderful uh, to welcome our first Sims Katz fellow, Svi Langman, here today as well. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Steve Weitzman, who is the director of the Herbert D. Katz Center, to say a few more words about tonight's program. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, as Will was mentioning, my name is Steve Weitzman. I'm the director of the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies. I always forget to say two things at the beginning of every introductory uh, remarks that I make, and that is to, first of all, ask you all to silence any cell phones that you may have so those don't disrupt the talk. And the second, um, I don't always forget to do this, but we will be having a reception after the lecture, and we want to warmly invite you all to join us so that we can continue the conversation that I'm sure will flow from our talk. Um, this is a three-part introductory preamble to our lecture tonight. Um, in a moment, we will, or in a few moments, we'll get to the introduction to our wonderful speaker this afternoon. But this talk is part of a larger context. It's part of a larger initiative. And I beg your indulgence while I describe that larger initiative and say a few words of thank you to the people who've made it possible. Um, so uh, about uh, three years ago, the Schoenberg Institute and the Katz Center came together to create a kind of book matchmaking, matchmaking program that would bring together a renowned scholar of manuscript study uh, with a manuscript in the Schoenberg collection. The goal of that program was uh, to make a contribution to research, to share uh, the story, the stories that uh, come along with the various manuscripts in the Schoenberg collection, and also to mine those manuscripts for philological and historical insight. Um, but we had aspirations for this visiting scholar that went beyond whatever publications came out of their work. We hoped that they would share their wisdom and their insight with a broader audience through um, online venues, through uh, online courses or seminars. Um, and in fact, since the program was conceived three years ago, uh, we produced uh, two of those online courses. And I have to confess, I've been amazed by how successful they've been. I think that one, if, if I remember correctly, one on a 15th century Judeo-Arabic scientific treatise um, has garnered something like 4,000 people participating in an online course about that manuscript. That's amazing to me. And I don't, I'm not an expert in the 15th century or the sources from that period, but I'm imagining that may mean that there are more people reading that manuscript today than were reading it in the 15th century. Um, the other component of this program is, involves the scholar uh, sharing their work in a public lecture. And to that, we are indebted to the Jewish Studies Program, Penn's Jewish Studies Program, which, uh, uh, whose support and uh, uh, funding has made uh, events like today possible. And, and so this is really a, a trilateral collaboration between the Katz Center, the Schoenberg Institute, Man uh, Institute for Manuscript Studies, and the Jewish Studies Program. And having said all that, I want to now thank the individual people who are responsible for this wonderful partnership. So the two leaders of this initiative are um, Lynn Ransom, 
who is a founding member of the Schoenberg Institute, and our own Natalie Dorman, Associate Director of the CAT Center. And they deserve a huge thank you for both conceiving and implementing such a wonderful initiative. I also want to thank uh, William Knoll, who you just saw, who's director of the Kislev Center for Special Collections and the Schoenberg Institute, for his wonderful support. And another key partner is the ever enterprising and supportive Arthur Kieran, who is curator of the Judaica Collection Fair Pen and who enriches the field of Jewish studies in so many ways. The final two partners who are instrumental in this initiative are my wonderful colleagues, uh, Talia Fishman and Kathy Hellerstein, in their role as the successive directors of the Jewish Studies program, and who have both kindly sponsored and supported this lecture. I also want to note, finally, that this whole program is meant to honor uh, my colleague, David Ruderman, who is here today with us this afternoon. Uh, um, David, as I'm sure many of you know, is an illustrious historian uh, of the Jewish people and um, founding director of the Cat Center who directed it for more than 20 years. Um, what makes it possible for us to bring scholars here for this program from places like Israel, Italy, and France is something called the David Ruderman Distinguished Scholar Program, which was established to honor David's intellectual contributions as a researcher, teacher, and academic leader. We've tried to use that program in a way that is consistent with the scholarly ideals that David himself embodies, and this moment is a chance for us to say thank you to David uh, for his own work and for doing so much to support so many other scholars. So thank you, David. And with that, I will turn things over to my colleague, Polly Fishman, who will actually introduce our... I agree with everything that Steve Weitzman said. Okay. Uh, my name is Talia Fishman. I'm actually here as a proxy on behalf of my colleague, Professor Catherine Hellerstein, who is the director of Penn's Jewish Studies program. She was not able to attend, and so uh, I, I am here in her place. Within the humanities, Riddle-solving scholars advance their fields of research in various ways. Some discover and decode previously unknown phenomena, whether texts, artifacts, or other cultural products. Some analyze known or unknown findings, previously unknown findings, and situate them within their relevant historical, geographic, and cultural or cross-cultural contexts. Those scholars who are able to do both must be attentive to minuscule details without losing sight of the big picture. Judith Olshovi Schlanger is this kind of a scholar. She is a philologist, a codicologist, a paleographer, and a historian. Her philology training uh, is from, in Hebrew, Semitic, and ancient Near Eastern languages uh, in Paris at the Institut National des Langues et Civilisations Orientales and the École des Langues Orientales Anciennes of the Institut Catholique. As a paleographer and codicologist, she, worked, she has worked with Colette Sirat, and she assumed uh, that position of, of senior researcher in the Hebrew paleography section of the Institut du, de Recherche et d'Histoire des Textes at the CNRS at, in Paris after Colette Sirat's uh, retirement. Uh, she also, Judith also has very highly attuned historical sensibilities, and she has applied these to several corpora of manuscripts from the Cairo Geniza in order to give a sense of Judith's disciplinary range and the range of fields which her research has transformed. I'd like to just very briefly mention a few of her projects. Judith was the first to study and to explain the marriage documents between Rabbinite and Karaite Jews, normally views, viewed as heretical or sect, her, uh, heretics or sectarians, in 11th century Egypt. These are contracts in which the partners, one Rabbinite, one Karaite, shockingly agreed to respect the religious practices and even the calendars of the other. Judith 
discovery and decoding and analysis of Hebrew and Hebrew Latin manuscripts from medieval England, a short-lived community in as much as the Jews were expelled in 1290. Her, these works of that Judith has brought to life have transformed our understanding of that rabbinic Jewish society and also transformed our, underst our understanding of uh, Christian Hebraism in medieval England because as her work has shown, her work is the building, or constitutes the building blocks that other historians have been able to use in reconstructing Jewish Christian uh, scholarly interactions, particularly regarding the Hebrew Bible. And this is a, a burgeoning field which, to my knowledge, wasn't really around 20 years ago. This is, again, Judith brought this to the fore. Her study of cheap materials in the Cairo Geniza enabled her to open windows onto the production, the marketing, and the use of writing materials by Jews of 10th and 11th century Egypt, and to reconstruct certain pedagogic practices of their communities. As an astute paleographer, Judith was intent on understanding how a particular Hebrew cursive was produced. So she and a practicing Hebrew calligrapher went to a London park, collected bird feathers that had fallen on the ground, and spent the next two days shaping quill pens with a scalpel until, voila, they succeeded in replicating the stroke in question. This type of reconstruction links Professor Olshovi Schlanger with the growing body of historians of science who are seeking to recover long neglected artisanal practices and their social embodiment. For several years, Judith was the president of the European Association of Jewish Studies, and her uh, interpersonal and managerial skills are, are also uh, put to important and good use uh, in as much as she is the head of the International Books Within Books Project, whose aim is to find, digitize, describe, and study fragments of medieval Hebrew manuscripts that were reused in order to strengthen the bindings of other books and of notar notarial files. Fragments of these Hebrew manuscripts have been found in the bindings of medieval artifacts in libraries throughout the world. Judith's energy, curiosity, expertise, generosity of spirit, and lack of pretense help to explain why she was elected, well, maybe, maybe the last several don't explain this part, but she was elected a corresponding fellow of the British Academy in, in 2016. Sorry, yes. And why she was enticed, this is where the personal qualities come in, why she was enticed to leave her position at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes in Paris in order to head the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies in England beginning this fall. You can see that I'm a great fan. Please join me in welcoming Professor Judith. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. And before I begin to talk about the Middle Ages, of course, it will be a pleasure to, and not only the duty, but really a pleasure to thank all these wonderful people who made my stay here a treat, an intellectual treat, but also a real pleasure. Uh, here, in the library of the University of Pennsylvania, I'm grateful to Will Noel, um, to Elizabeth Bates, to Lynn Ransom, who took such a wonderful care of me, to Amy Hutchins that I have met in Oxford last year, to Eri, Abigail, and Aaron, who uh, not only helps me with the books in the reading room, but found a doctor when I needed one. So it was absolutely wonderful. In the Herbert Cutt Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, which was my home for the second time. I was here three years ago. I would like to thank Steve Weizmann very warmly, Natalie Dorman, who picked me up from the airport and was just a wonderful guide for me here, Arthur Kieran, and of course, David Ruderman, who have always encouraged me and, um, and uh, took care of me here, but also Joseph and Bruce, who helped me in the library and who are really a great scholars. Um, my stay here was short but intense, and I have managed to discover new manuscripts and to have new projects. I, I am really 
grateful to you and to all of you for being here. Uh, I would like as well to stress before I begin, I don't that I, I know that I don't have such an enormous amount of time, but there are things that I must say. Um, the, the subject I'm going to talk about, the scribes from the Geniza, uh, started here three years ago at the uh, Lehman workshop that, that Talia very kindly invited me to, and I'm very grateful to, to her uh, for that as well. I was talking about low cost Hebrew manuscripts and their production from the Cairo Geniza. And the paper that I'm going to present today is a follow up three years later of this first um, project that, that I, was, I had the privilege of develop here. So we are going to go now to, to the Middle Ages. We are in 1013 and the leader of the Babylonian congregation in Fustat Elhanan ben Shemaria returns home from Damascus to find his community in a desolate state. Victims to the plague and victims to the persecution of the Caliph al-Hakim. But he mourns in particular, I quote, writings and scrolls torn into pieces and scattered like seeds. Pentateuch codices cast on the ground. Unfortunately, the tribulations of the Jewish people uh, did not favor the preservation of the most cherished but very fragile material artifacts, the books. Only a small percentage of Hebrew books produced in the Middle Ages have been preserved. But despite Al-Hakim, the medieval capital of Egypt, Fustat, is an exception. The Jewish inhabitants of Fustat were active book producers, compulsive readers, and most importantly, they filled up the Geniza room of the synagogue Ben Ezra, not only with sacred writings, this we can of course expect, but also with any written matter, however profane or trivial. The discovery of the Cairo Geniza by European scholars in the 19th century provided, can you hear me well? Yeah, okay. <laughs> provided Jew Jewish historians with a massive corpus of more than 300,000 fragments of books, documents, and letters. A real battlefield of books. Yeah. A very famous picture, you have seen it probably hundreds of times, but it's a good picture, so it doesn't matter if you see it once more again. A real battlefield of books, as described by Solomon Schechter, that you can see here, whose trip from Cambridge to Cairo and back loaded with crates of unsorted and dirty Geniza contents, marks the beginning of the historical research of this wonderful collection. Most of the fragments date from the Fatimid and Ayyubid period from Egypt, but also from other oriental communities. And more than 95% are books rather than documents. They were preserved thanks to the Jewish respectful management of writings that went out of use. The management which was based on the belief in the holiness of the Hebrew writings that could contain the name of God. And despite the various destructions and rebuilding of the Geniza chamber, it did not stay from the 11th century until the 19th century without moving. It was rebuilt, the contents were taken out, scattered, and so on and so forth. But still, this necropolis of discarded books, contracts, and letters is an exceptional evidence of a massive, massive culture of readers and reading. It is not possible today, not yet, to ascertain to how many codices and scrolls the fragments originally belonged. According to a rough estimate by Professor Malachi Betarier, that we are going to quote a lot today, there were maybe as many as 40,000 books that were produced and read by the Jews in Fustat between 950 and 1250 
it's an enormous amount of books. These numbers imply, of course, a considerable community of readers. If there are so many books, this is because people need them and want them. Indeed, books and written documents are omnipresent in Jewish medieval society. Of course, we still talk about the oral transmission of Talmud and learning and so on and so forth. We are not got, get, getting into this field. We really find evidence of a very literate culture and book-based culture. Jewish liturgy is, of course, centered around the book and the rit ritualistic reading of the book. Medieval economy is based on written record. It's extremely important. It's regulated by contracts. Talmudic students or white-collar uh, professionals such as physicians, judges, teachers, or bureaucrats, but also increasingly other social strata take full advantage of literacy to deepen their knowledge, to climb social ladders, very important in medieval Egypt, to carry lucrative business activity, but also simply to enjoy. This is what is very important, as we can judge from the presence in the Geniza of such books like Alexander Romance or Kalila Wandimna or The Arabian Nights. The one-to-one -one intimate relationship between the book and its reader, this silent personal readership and uh, experience of learning is very well attested in the Geniza society, as is the collective practice of reading in a synagogue or school. But of course, before being read, the book and document needs to be written. And this is why in the preprint society, the central figure is the scribe or the copist. I'm not teaching you anything new here. The condition of a scribe or copist is often a modest one, and usually we don't know the name of these people. They are anonymous. However, they work requires talent, learning, physical resilience, so hard and hard manual labor. Today, I will try just to shed some light on the identity, on the social status, on the training, but also on, on the working context and conditions of the scribes in what we usually call the Geniza society, the classical Geniza society that means between the 10th and the 13th centuries. So, if a Geniza person, men, very rarely a woman, so usually a man, wanted to read a book, what, what this person would do? He had several possibilities to get a book to read. All of them are documented in the Geniza. He could buy a book, he could inherit a book, he could get it as a present, he could steal it, he could loot a book, he could save it from, from looting, he could read at someone else's home, he could read the books in a bookseller's shop, or for some specific books, he could go to the synagogue and read it in a synagogue or Beit Midrash, not for all the books. But what about getting a brand new book? So what about producing books in the Geniza society? And here I am turning to the influential work of Malachi Betarier, who stressed the specificity of the Hebrew book production in respect to the majority cultures, Latin, Christian, and Muslim in the East. According to Malachi Betarier, whereas the Christian and Muslim cultures mm, were extremely institutionalized as far as book production was concerned, either scriptoria, monastic scriptoria, or university-controlled workshops, or for the Muslim um, uh, parts the official caliphal libraries. The, according to Malachi Betarier, the making of Hebrew books was almost exclusively the product of private initiative aimed as per, at personal use. And all this is confirmed, but we are going to see that there are some nuances to this statement. So according to Malachi Betarier, if you wanted to have a new book, you had two possibilities. Either you hired a scribe 
to copy a book for you, or you copied the book yourself on the basis of the colophons of some 3,500 3, books, which are all recorded in the wonderful data database, which is called Svardata, of the Israeli Codicology Project, Malachi Betarier concluded that all in all, 38% of books all over Europe, all, uh, sorry, all over Jewish diaspora in the Middle Ages were produced by a scribe working on commission for a specific patron. 29% were produced by a scribe working for himself, so user produced books, and 33% do not contain in the colophons a mention why and for what reason they were produced. Malachi Betarier proposes to join this 33% to self-producer books, saying if the scribe does not say that he produced it for someone, logically he produced it for himself, which may not be the case. But anyway, for Malachi Betarier, the majority of Hebrew books are self-produced, which has incredible implications. Of course, if you have such a percentage of self-produced books. That means that Jewish individuals are not only literate, but they can make books. It's much more than just reading the books and being able to use them. And also it has implications we are going to leave aside today for the way the books are transmitted in a very little controlled way as far as the transmission of the texts is concerned. These two contexts of producing books that Malachi found studying the colophons from all over the diaspora, uh, stage both of them, the owner of the book, as the first cause and also the ultimate shaper of the book. You make the book that you want and you make it in the way you want it to be. <clears throat> both of these ways are very well attested in the Cairo Geniza. The communal institutions, if we compare with scriptorium or university or libraries, in the Jewish uh, medieval Egypt, so the synagogues, Batei Midrash, or Yeshivot, play a major role in the diffusion of the written books and texts. To use the, 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 the book history words in the book consumption. However, they have, why? Because obviously you need books for prayer, for liturgy, and for study. So the synagogue will need the books. However, the synagogue from our evidence, does not play an important role in the producing of the books. So the synagogue as an institution is, let us say, at the receiving end of all the process. The synagogue is very happy to accept a book donated by a private person as a waqf or hegdesh, the pious donation. And indeed, the charitable donation implied that a wealthy individual, often a woman, it's very frequent in the, in the Middle East, commissioned a book and then donated it to the synagogue. Dedicatory inscriptions on donated books sometimes specify that the book was made with the patron's own money. It's very important. There is this financial aspect. The waqf was an important institution in a society in which patronage and charity was, were the pillar of the social order. This is the case of most of the medieval society. Giving a book to a charitable end was particularly important. It was an elegant and visible, attested by an inscription on public display, way of giving alms, giving charity. The work was therefore one of the major incentives for book production and also the way for the scribes to earn their life, to have jobs, to copy books. <clears throat> a chazan and scribe, I give just a few examples. Each time I, 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 I talk about something, I will give one or two examples. A chazan and scribe, Isaac ben Baruch, who left Fustat to look for employment in the provinces, in the Egyptian reef, is writing for Samanud, writes to his wife, asking her to get in touch with a lady called Um Thana to tell her that her eagerly awaited Pentateuch was in the making, that he's working on it, that he hasn't forgotten. 
it seems indeed that the book was happily finished because, I quote, a new codex of the Torah ordered and dedicated to the synagogue by Um Tana is safely listed among the possessions of the Babylonian synagogue in Fustat in 1181. So we have the letter and we have the list, the book list that talks about the same woman who dedicated it. Even for restoring damaged codices, the synagogue needed a private donor, even for cherished properties of the synagogue. In a letter from the Bodleian Library, and I think that uh, I will be able to uh, show it to you. Well, I didn't show it to you. This is a Pentateuch with the dedicatory inscription that you can uh, um, that you can see here. So this is one of these work dedications to the to the synagogue. Yes. <clears throat> so the, this wonderful letter from the Bodleian Library, Geniza Collection, reports, it's a, it's a letter of a, of a person who is involved in the affairs of the Palestinian community in Fustat in the 13th century. This person reports to a paying patron on his efforts to restore a 9th century codex which is owned by the synagogue. This codex is known as, as the brother of the Taj, the brother of the crown, and some people think that the Taj is the Aleppo codex, which is quite possible. After difficulties in finding a scribe for this hard and little paid job, a certain Rabbi Daniel examined the codex at, at his home and declared that 12 choirs were in a very poor state and that all the 60 leaves, that's enormous, 60 leaves of a manuscript needed doing over again. That means passing with the ink on the letters. And in the Geniza, we have lots of books which were restored in this way. He agrees to the low salary of one dirham per leaf, doing one leaf of, of, the, of the manuscript. The writer urges the recipient to accept these conditions because he says that all the other scribes refused and they said, a waking of the dead is a greater feat than the creation of man. So people didn't want to do this restoring. It was a bad work, difficult, and so on and so forth. So even the repair of such a cherished book was given, was left to, a, to the mercy of a private donor. Patrons also hired scribes to copy books for their own private libraries. So you could copy it for a synagogue, but you could, you could as well copy it for yourself. A book list which was written in 1153 records the purchases, but also the commissions, write the book for me, of a private collector. From the, we don't have his name, but from the contents of his library, we, well, when I, when I talk about book lists, I refer to the Jewish library uh, of Nehemia Aloni, the articles which were uh, united by Haggai Ben Shammai, Sokolov, and especially Miriam Frankel. So the, this, the book lists I refer to have been published. They haven't been analyzed. So <coughs> from the contents of this particular book list, we gather that the owner was a Talmudic scholar. And also we gather that he bought the books for himself because at the beginning of the list, he writes, these are all the books I have acquired. May God give me the privilege to read them in order to know, obey, and follow what the creator, may he be blessed, ordered us to do. So for once, a man buying books for himself, and I must say, he is buying the most expensive books in the Geniza, the most expensive Bible on record, 37 gold dinars and a half. It's in his possession. We don't know who he was. We know the dates, mid 12th century. Patrons could also commission freelance scribes. An excellent example, it's the calligrapher that we all know, Samuel Ben Jacob, who copied in 1006 the famous Leningrad 
codex that you have here, beautifully decorated, and which is the basis of the Kittel edition, Stuttgartensia edition, of the Bible as we know it and as we studied, studied it at the university. That's the work of Shmuel ben Jacob. He also copied a number of other books. You have a list that I have established here. Some of them are identified in the Geniza fragments, and quite a lot of work was done recently by, by Ben Outwaite in Cambridge on this particular scribe. Samuel, we are really lucky because we have in the Geniza a contract which hires Samuel ben Jacob. The contract was written, as you see here, in 1021. Samuel ben Jacob has to write, vocalize, put the masora, put the decorations, bind a book. This book is going to be two parts of the Bible, the prophets and the writings, and he's going to earn all in all 25 gold dinars for two parts of the Bible. So when we add the Torah, that by the way, the, the contract says that he has already copied before, very important contract. So when we add the Torah, it will be one as well of the most expensive books of records. We will get as well to 30 and some uh, gold dinars. You could buy an enormous amount, several houses for this, for this in, um, in Fustat. So we have ample evidence. Well, of course, it's very expensive. But when you think about the amount of work which goes into a copy of the Bible, Masoretic Bible, consonantal text, adding the vowels in the second time, decoration, uh, correction, and so on and so forth, writing the Masora annotations, Masora pa Parva, Masora Magna, the codex like this one of 491 folios, we have actually here, three years ago, we reconstructed the rhythm of the work of the scribe. It would take him several months up to one year to finish this work because we know that a scribe of this caliber, a calligrapher, could write about two large parchment folios a day. So you can calculate, it takes an enormous amount of time, you take away the Shabbat, the festivals, and also the dusk. The scribes did not have electric light, light like today. It makes the, the writing time very short. So, indeed, we have as well ample evidence in the Geniza. Sometimes I cheat a little bit. I quote as well Oriental colophons and other Oriental books, which were not discovered in the Geniza, or some of them come from the same source, but were taken by Abraham Fukovich, the Karaite, from Cairo to St. Petersburg earlier. So sometimes I give as well full codices, but from the same cultural context. They could come from the Geniza. These are the, these are the books exactly from Egypt or from other places. Well, this one is different. It was copied in Aden, but there were contacts between Yemen and uh, Egypt as well. So we have here uh, the colophon, which says that the scribe copied it in his own handwriting and for himself. These two things are specified. Both he writes for himself, but also in his own handwriting, because we have books whose colophon says, I copied it for myself, and they are written by five different scribes. So we have it as well. I will talk about such a book uh, soon. So indeed, we have, uh, we have these possibilities, and we have as well very poor quality books in the Cairo Geniza, which are written and by, by hundreds or by thousands, which are written on reused material, or the choirs are made up from reject parts, like this, what I call Frankenstein Haggadah, because you know, Haggadot, <laughs> the art historians always give them names, okay? There is the golden Haggadah. This, this is from the Geniza, you see, in order to make a, a page, the pieces of parchment were stitched together to make a leaf, so really cheap, and probably people made it no cost at all for themselves. However, in addition to these two modes of production, which were envisioned by Malachi Betarier, the patronage and the very humble do-it-yourself, the Geniza provides a wealth of information on another mode of book production in urban workshops. In fact, the Geniza reveals that book production was professionalized and related very much to the book trade. A crucial role 
in making books in the Geniza textualized society was played by the warakun, warak. That's the term we are going to use a lot. So I explain. Literally, it means paper matter dealers from the word warak, which means paper in Arabic, equivalent to the librari or stationary of the Western uh, world. In a recent article, Miriam Frankel suggested that warakun were a part of an elite network in which bookmakers, booksellers, book buyers, authors, and readers interchanged. They were, they were using these books and making these books in a network. The warakun were involved in different forms of trade, but indeed we are going to find out they were extremely active in all forms of book and book material, trade and making. The warak was an institution, institution of the Muslim world, which was associated with the growth of the urban uh, literate civilization. According to Ibn Khaldun in the 14th century, you have the quotation here, the emergence of the profession of warak, which consists of the copying, correcting, binding, and all other things related to books and office wear is linked to the development of cities and exists in the large cities with the advanced culture. It's quite pro probable, by the way, that the workshops and the institution of warak actually survived from the Roman and Byzantine time in the East because it existed in the antiquity. Such writing professionals that fulfilled a whole range of intellectual and bureaucratic functions are also well documented in specifically Jewish documents from the Cairo Geniza. And they seem to have been a totally commonplace. In addition to letters and documents, the Geniza has preserved specific pinkasim registers of this warakin, warakun, sorry. For instance, one document, which is lots of folios, um, you see from 26 to, to, to 52, very well preserved Geniza, very small, bad quality, paper, tiny codex. It's a warax pinkas. It's a day book in which this trader copied all his business transactions, all the administration matters, and also, um, well, first of all, he, I, I, I should say you, you have his date. So in the 12th century, he covered his transactions and his matters in a chronological order. So that's why I'm calling this Pinkas a day book. He just recorded all his things. He used Arabic and Hebrew script interchangeably. And he noted not only the books that he sold, but also the books that people borrowed from him for money, the books that he accepted as collateral in the loans that he gave. Okay, so there are lots of different, different things. He also, in this, uh, in this booklet, put his, his own personal accounts, like monies for buying uh, lemon sherbet, sugar, almonds, syrup, sugar syrup, and so on and so forth. And also, very important, he put eight drafts of legal documents, just basic information. What does it mean? It means that the warak who was a bookmaker, was also legal documents ma maker. He was a bureaucrat. He was a public scrivener where people could come, make a transaction in front of him. He would take notes, okay, this one sold or this one married. And then he would sit down and according to the legal formularies, make a proper legal document. So as you can see, the role of such a warak is extremely complicated. They, can, they have very different roles. And we know as well that some of the warakun were physicians, apothecaries, uh, money lenders, great merchants. For instance, Nahorai ben Nisim. We have dozens of the documents of his archive from the mid 11th century in the Cairo Geniza. He was one of the Tunisian, Tunisian Maghrebi merchants. We know that he dealt in books and he had his own private library. He was a, a bibliophile. We have as well in the Cairo Geniza judges and intermediaries of the buying and selling secondhand and new books. Such an intermediary is called Samsar, and some book lists even give us his provision 
which was 10% of the price of the book. So we have quite precise information about how book trade was going. Some warakun were bookbinders, and as well, just like the Muslim counterparts, we have evidence that some warakun were also scholars and writers, in their own authors in their own right. An excellent example, I have jumped several things, but an excellent example is Joseph Rochhaseder. Dozens of manuscripts in his very characteristic Iraqi handwriting have been discovered in the Cairo Geniza, but also among Oriental codices. We have colophons of the books that he copied. At the end of the 12th century, he left Baghdad. He was the son of a Gaonic uh, emissary of the Gaonic Babylonian academies to the, um, to the Jewish diaspora, and he settled in Pustat. He wrote books that he copied himself, he copied other books, and he was also a Warak. We have book lists in his hand where we see that he was simply a book dealer. So you have very, very complicated relationship and lots of different functions of this Warakun. So not only the scribe, they could be scribes, but also booksellers. But also we have evidence that the Warak was an entrepreneur who was employing other scribes to copy books. And this is what is extremely important uh, for the understanding of how a workshop and the third way of making books functioned. So, <clears throat> for instance, we have a Warak in the 12th century who writes, I quote, to to a scribe who is working for him somewhere far away. We don't know where. Dear sir, be so kind to copy the tafsir, the uh, Arabic translation, of the Rabbi Sa'adia, well, Sa'adia Gaon, of course, to Daniel and Ezra. And let it not be like the tafsir of Psalms that you made for me. It was written in a difficult script that I was unable to copy anything from it. So you have immediately the notion that people sent him a book from somewhere so that he can use it as a copy immediately. So they would just go to all kinds of communities to bring exemplars, not just books, but books to make, to copy. That's what is important. He adds, if it is like that, don't bother sending anything at all. A fascinating document that I have ex examined in another context, and by the way, I showed it as well, my preliminary ideas three years ago here, is this one from the British Library. Recto and verso, unfortunately, just one leaf preserved from the records of a bookseller. This bookseller is amazing. Not only, you can see it in the first line, I think so. Up, oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, in the first line in uh, here, not only he's dealing with international book trade, he's an Amazon.com, sending books from Fustat to Cordoba, he sent 30, Al Jumla in Arabic script, Lamet Kutub, okay, you have it here in, in green, but also, very important, he employs six scribes, and five of these scribes whose names are listed here. You have them in light blue on the verso. Has al al sofrim al sofrim. Okay, these scribes called Isaac ben Maimun ben Saadal ben Suli e ben Hama are all involved in a simultaneous production copy of two exemplars of two copies of the Book of Splendor, Kitab al Istirna, which is a biblical dictionary of Shmuel Hanagid. And what we get just from these very unpleasant to read notes and difficult to read notes, we see that the Warak not only employs the scribes, but also gives them the exemplar, the pieces of the book to copy. And we see that his master copy of Kitab al Istirna is divided into Jews, into sections, according to the letters of the alphabet. And he writes precisely which one of them okay, receives what part of the book to copy. Here I made it clear for you. Okay? So we have exactly the system very similar to the medieval university specia, which allows 
for the copy of several books, several copies at the same time. The role of the warak is later to, come to check this kind of book that he and his scribes have produced, and indeed to correct the version of the text. In the 12th century, a list of Shlomo Halevi, it's a book list again, lists the books not only describing them according to the writing material, parchment paper, the type of script that it's used, square or cursive, mu'allak, he uses all these terms, whether they are bound or unbound, and so on and so forth, the titles, the prices. But he also includes a very important information. You have it in red here. It is sahih. The book has been corrected. And indeed, we have manuscripts, very important manuscripts. I give you one example here on which I have worked a lot, <laughs> which was copied by at least six different scribes. You have in red the corrections on the book. You have, of course, you have here, of course, the, the, uh, the book itself. And I should add, I put, didn't put it here. It was copied in 1279. So it's a dated, explicitly dated book, probably in Aleppo, probably in Syria. So we have here corrections that were introduced to the copy. We have, well, this is just a catchword to go to another choir. But look at that. What is this? Muga. Every choir of the book contains this little, this little mark that people almost don't see, which means corrected. Okay? Very important. Good. So, what we have here is the books could be produced by individually hired scribes, that could be self produced, and also simply they were produced by scribes working for a salary in a workshop. So we have no problem about that. But who were the scribes? Of course, when you have self-produced books, everybody could copy a book. Every Jewish man went to school at the age of seven and had some, at least some notion of writing. Of course, the warakun were specialists. They were scribes par excellence. Scholars as well sometimes wrote, even, not, even if they were not warakun, wrote fair copies of their own book. And the most important known and famous example is Maimonides, who, first of all, advocated that every Jewish man should copy or commission a Torah scroll for himself, that Maimonides did. And also, uh, he apparently copied his own, he made a fair copy of his own commentary on the Mishnah, whose uh, two volumes are today preserved, one in the Bodleian Library and one in the National Library of Israel. Um, the, what is important as well is that Maimonides was very particular about the scribal transmission of his own books. He checked the books, like this, um, this very famous um, Bodleian Library Mishneh Torah manuscript. He checked books copied by other scribes and gave them an ijazah, very common title in Arabic world, the license, say, saying, as you can see it here, in his own writing, okay, Huga Misifri, Ani Moshe Bar Rabbi Maimon, Zichonno Libraha. Okay, so he wrote his own inscription, I, I, Moshe ben, ben Maimon, this book was corrected from my book, from my book, okay, Huga. So he was, he was very careful about correcting his own books with, before they were, they were circulated. And also, quite interesting, quite interesting, he was also worried about the transmission of his books in Arabic characters. When, when he wrote the guide, he immediately, well, we, we know it from Arabic sources of, uh, of Abu Latif, actually, he did not like the idea of copying it in Arabic characters. He even said that he would put a curse on people who do it. Of course, it was not respected at all. And immediately, guide was circulating in both Arabic and Hebrew characters. And we have evidence that it reached Provence in Arabic characters before it reached Provence in Hebrew characters. Uh, but, um, and also, you know, in the Geniza, we have lots of leaves of the guide in Arabic where Hebrew is left in Hebrew characters. You can't see it so easily immediately because this scribe is so good in both Arabic and Hebrew that it's, he's just a natural. So 
uh, we had as well, so we have the scholars working on manuscripts. We have as well legal notaries, legal clerks, copying books. For instance, we have, I give you just one example of a man I have been working a lot on. I kind of discovered him from different, different manuscripts that he copied. This is Paltiel Ben Ephraim Hechaver, who was a witness and a scribe of the first known to us Beit Din of Fustat, which was the Beit Din of Shemaria Ben Elhanan, the father of Elhanan with whom we started our talk today. So end of the 10th century and beginning of the 11th century. Actually, Paltiel died in, the, in, in 1011, probably in the plague, and this is his funeral, which started riots, which were transformed later into the persecution of Al-Hakim. So actually, he's a famous person, but we needed to correct, co connect the person mentioned in Megillat Mitzrayim in a literary work with the person whose handwriting we actually have in the Cairo Geniza. So we have here, this is just his signature, very characteristic handwriting with, you know, this tongue hanging down on several letters, excuse me the expression. So we have his uh, signature in three legal documents, and we have as well at least uh, manuscripts, fragments coming from three different copies of liturgical small codices that he copied. And he was also the owner of books copied by other scribes. We have here simply his ex libris. It's not a book that he copied. So there were people who did all kind of different jobs. But there are people as well whose names are followed by the name of Sofer, Kotev, or, or Lavlar. And we know that they were professional scribes. That means people that others were ready to pay for the work that they did. They were so good. So everybody could write, but not everybody could be this professional scribe. You needed special talents. Not everyone has the artistic talent to do it. So in order to become a scribe, first of all, you had to learn how to write. Okay. So you, we have in the Cairo Geniza ample evidence that children learned the shapes of the letters as well as the tracing, the ductus of the letters. Once you knew your letters, you had to copy texts. Here we have an example of the text written by the teacher, Bereshit Bara, so on and so forth, beginning of Genesis, and the child who tries to copy. The ideal being, of course, to make a perfect fake. The student has to copy like the teacher. We know as well the children were learning Hebrew and Arabic at the same time, sometimes on the same page. And by the way, I find his Arabic much better than his Hebrew, <laughs> which, is also, which is also important, given that the learning was done actually in the synagogues for Hebrew. And we know as well that the scribes used Hebrew and Arabic script completely interchangeably. And this, uh, um, this uh, manuscript, this letter, you see the letter in Arabic script, and then it was reused a hundred or so years later for a Mishnah commentary between the lines, okay? So the Arabic letters is, is written by a Karaite from mid-11th century in Jerusalem. Uh, Jeffrey Kahn worked on this manuscript and showed that the copy in Hebrew or Arabic characters depended just on the wish of the patron and not at all on the scribe's skill. He was able to do both, just as, as you ask. But once people learned how to read and write, it did not stop. You had to train. You had to work on your handwriting to have your specific style. <laughs> and I would like to, 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 to show you this absolutely amazing example. As you can see, Ani Shmuel Ben Yaakov Katavti Venakatti Umasarti. And a biblical quotation upside down, uh, vertically, from Nehemiah. What is that? Shmuel Ben Yaakov? We know Shmuel Ben Yaakov. He is the scribe of the Leningrad Codex. Well, and some people used this manuscript to say, well, this is yet another manuscript handwriting of Shmuel Ben Yaakov. Well, I looked at it, I said, no, 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 12th century, no way, paleography, it's all wrong. And when we turn the page, this is the verse of this page, we actually discover the real author of these lines. His name was Shlomo Halevi Ben Rabbi Shmuel Hadayan, okay? That's the scribe, paleographically it fits, and we actually know him very well. He was 
you have here the manuscripts that he copied that we have. He was active at the beginning of the 13th century in Egypt. This is his square handwriting from manuscripts with colophons that I was able to compare. I was very happy to discover one here in Halper, okay, where we have both his square script and the cursive that he uses in other manuscripts as well. And what is very important here is that what we see is that a 13th century scribe, in order to become a good, good scribe, trains on the model of a scribe who is dead for 200 years. Okay, he copies his work to train. To have a, that's why the Hebrew handwriting is so conservative. Um, of course, well, we won't have time to work properly on, on, the, on how the scribes started to work. They prepared the parchment, they ruled it, uh, sometimes with the use for the paper of a mastara, of a, uh, of a special device to make it quicker. They had to prepare, to plan their work in advance. We won't have time to go into details, but I see that you are smiling, you know this manuscript very well, yeah, Laura. So we have a wonderful example that was studied by Jay Rovner in 2011. This is an Elkan Nathan Adler manuscript. And what happens here? On the flesh side, we have what we call a carpet page of a manuscript. You see the micrography, the biblical quotations in a very beautiful design. On this side, the her side, we have, we have a copy of an old Midrash. This one is 11th century. This one is earlier. So this is a part of what we call a rotulus. It was a long, long, long roll not like a scroll, you know, horizontal scroll, but a vertical scroll. An old midrash was written, written on it. Usually the rotuli were like scrolls were written only on one side, very often. Luckily for our scribe, about 100 year, years later, the text was written on what the text, rabbinic text called the black side, the dark side, not the nice one. The flesh white side was left blank and the scribe could use it to make what? When we go here, you see very easily the lines, the trial. He did a model to copy it in a book he was preparing, of course, in order to make a draft, a plan, a template of his carpet page. He would not use a fresh, expensive parchment, but he is going somewhere to the Geniza and picks it up. The scribes as well used these Geniza uh, old uh, letters to train, to all kinds of exercises, but also for the trials just before the copy. It is essential to get your ink right, composition of the ink, the quality of the ink. We know that the scribes from the reef, from the provinces, are sending to Fustat to get proper ink. And it's also important to have a calamus, the writing instrument of good quality and properly cut. We have very interesting um, documents uh, from the Cairo Geniza, a letter which says, written from Alexandria to Nahorai ben Nisim in the 50s of the 11th century, where they, the, the writer sa says, okay, the reed of the lake of, uh, I think, my root, it's not ready yet. When it is dry, I will pick it up for you and I will personally cut it into pens for you and send them to you to Fustat. So, you know, it's important. The way the calamus is cut, the nib, the width of the nib, the way it works, it gives the proportions of the calligraphic script and it gives the rhythm to the text. It's really important. So you train the calamus, you train the ink, like on this, again, from Halper, absolutely wonderful example, where you have the scribe copying from the other side the sentences from the other side, which is a poem in honor of a person, <coughs> but also all kind of basic, very well-known scribal formula, like for instance, he's saying, Nision dio la dat yo fio, the trial of the pen to know its beauty, that all over Jewish di diaspora, in all the countries you find this formula. It's a transmission without problem. In the in the Jewish culture. Also in Arabic, Tajriba, Hebr, 
the, the, the trial of the ink and also Kalam. And very interesting, the same scribe sometimes writes the same in, in Arabic in Hebrew characters and in Arabic in Arabic characters. So he can train in both. He's completely bi-alphabetical. That's, that's uh, quite an important element. Okay, so unfortunately, we won't have time to go into details of the scribal work. I have spoken already for too long, and I will have to conclude this, um, uh, this talk. I would like just to conclude by saying that we had a quick look at some of the Geniza scribes. We found that some of them were refined intellectuals. Others were just skilled laborers, or even unskilled laborers. Some were respected artists and the others were mediocre hacks. <laughs> Some were experts in all aspects of bookmaking, able to deliver a finished, bound, and decorated codex. The others were specialists. They could copy consonants, others would copy only vowels, others were proofreaders, others were binders, and there were as well illuminators, those who decorated the books. Some of them were scholars. They were making book, books for themselves at leisure. Others were freelance and sought after calligraphers. And some of them were poor workers sweating in the Warak's workshops. But we can hope, and I will conclude with that, that at least some of them could say, like the great Samuel Ben Jacob, that we saw several times today in the colophon of his masterpiece, the Leningrad Codex. Samach libi begorali, bechol libi asiti melachti. My heart rejoiced in my destiny. I did my work wholeheartedly. Thank you for your attention.